but then the, the other thing is, you know, you have institutional counterparties to work with in this space. So people are doing this. And that's, to me, one of the most interesting areas of, of digital assets and specifically derivatives right now is there's actually a lot more happening than people realize. And so that's coming through OTC markets, which is generally how a lot of the big guys are, are playing um, in the derivative space. But then there's also listed markets. So there's been a lot of talk about what's going to happen with potentially listed options on IBIT, you know, the, the BlackRock ETF. So um, Chris Perkins, I don't know if you'd, you'd want to add anything there, but I think those are two really interesting developments. Would love your perspective. I think it's still pretty early uh, for robust derivatives markets. Uh, if you look at, what do we say, digital, non-digital non finance. Non-digital, yeah. Uh, interest rate markets, $500 trillion asset class, uh, only now beginning to show their head uh, in, in crypto. Why? Because some derivatives markets are largely institutional derivatives markets. Those markets really haven't ar arisen yet and really cultivated that liquidity. But the utility is so obvious. Right? Why? Because you know, when I step back and I see what's happening right now, I see fixed income everywhere, but those markets haven't materialized. How do I see it? I see it in the form of, of uh, perps. We have funding rates, right? Those are rates. I see it in the form of staking rates. Oh my gosh. And trust me when I tell you that as institutions enter this space, they're going to want to hedge those rates. And there are other folks who are going to say, wow, what an incredible opportunity to speculate on those rates. And those are defined terms in, in traditional markets. So I think we're at the, the starting line for what's going to be a very exciting and robust market. Um, and, and the other issue that we've had is that we've lacked regulatory clarity. Um, and so, yes, we've got Bitcoin and ETH. We're pretty sure those things are commodities right now. But as you go down the stack, I'm very excited to see um, the market understand the characterization in the United States of where these assets lie, and then you're going to see the derivatives markets pop. You know, there's, I just want to underscore one point you were making. You know, Bitcoin being a sovereignless, decentralized, monetary asset, um, it doesn't have a yield curve yet, right? It will someday. It doesn't have a yield curve yet because it's not issued by a sovereign that also issue, issues debt. But there are borrowing and lending markets, so. There should be, even if there's not like a sovereign yield curve, there should be the equivalent of a swap curve, right? And the moment there's a swap curve, and there's somewhat, and there's two trillion of you know Bitcoin, right? Or one trillion now, but two trillion or ten trillion years from now, uh, there will be a yield curve, and there will be interest rate swaps because there will be borrowing and lending against that, and many people will want to convert between a floating and a fixed rate. So there's there's no reason why those structures won't evolve. Um, and so it's great to talk about equity options and yield enhancement and speculation. And, but, but I think that's a key point that uh, if you go all the way from perpetual futures, which if you don't know how they work, we, you know, we, should, we should get into how they work because they're fascinating, all the way to term rates uh, and a term structure and a swap market, that's, that's real money, right? That's the real institutional money. And that, that's going to happen. It's not if, it's when. Uh, in the venture side, we're seeing a lot of really interesting projects popping up right now trying to solve it. I, what, what my question is, is like, what's going to be the catalyst? Um, and maybe it's some of that regulatory de-risking that we're going to see post-election. And, and I'll add to the, the, the level of sophistication that's entering the derivatives market right now is mind-boggling. I mean, just over the last two years, uh, that the derivatives market's gone from a, a mainly uh, retail-focused, uh, driven market to very much an institutional-driven market now. Um, you know, if you go back, um, back to 21 when I joined uh, DRW, um, you know, everyone was talking about hodling. Hodling was the, everyone just wanted to be long and forget about it. And over the last three years, we've had a number of major, <laughs> major instances within crypto that you probably would have had to have, you know, lived 20 years in the TradFi markets in order to see that, that level of ups and downs. And what that's really brought to light is the fact that you can't just hodl crypto. You need, if you're running a large portfolio of crypto, you need to be able to uh, hedge it, you need to be able to generate yield, you need to um, manage this portfolio to make sure that at the end of the day you go, go home and you haven't lost, um, you know, your investors' money. So uh, it's, been, it's been really refreshing to see institutional accounts enter the space, space bring strategies that they've honed in equities and rates and FX and really start um, bringing the, uh, the level of, of um, 
realized vol lower and kind of bring in a little more maturity to the market. 